Cool. All right. So hello, everybody. We're going to resume today or A201, um, general conditions of the contract. Uh, we left it at 9.6.8. I'm actually going to read 9.6.7 for the sake of going a little bit back on like previously on this chapter, right? Kind of thing. So section nine in general, it's all about payments. It's super critical, payments. And I always tell people that payments are one of the biggest duties of the owner um, more than anybody else. Um, that's kind of all they do, right? They either approve something, reject it, yeah, but they they really are here to write a check. That's a big part of, of their job. So and I spoke about you know schedule values, applications for payments, and how, how the whole process works. Um, and I always kind of go back. That's why it was taking so long to finish the A2-1 because I like to show you the sequence of how things work. So, you know, we have submittal schedules and the submittal schedules show you all the things that are to come and they're given to you as the architect from the contractor. And one of the submittals that come on the submittal schedules are actually a, a schedule of values a actual schedule for the construction of the project. And on the schedule of values is that document that tells you what everything costs so that you know, hey, I am, you know, how do I how do I price something out? Where, where are these numbers coming from? How do you certify a payment, which is your duty as the architect? You certify a payment, um, whether in full or you reject it or a portion of it. So you use the schedule of value, right? And um, as you watch the A2-1, you'll see that I mentioned before that within, I believe, seven or 10 days of the prior to the payment being due, let's say it's the 30th of every month. So the 20th of every month, the contractor is going to come to the architect with an application for payment. Here, many people call it a requisition, but it's mostly is an application for payment. And that application for payment comes to the architect and says, you know, I want payment for let's say $500,000 for all, such and such, such and such, such and such. And they break it down and they put some attachments to it too. And me as the architect or you as the architect will look at the schedule of values. And I always tell you what my process is like and how that process applies to the AIA contracts. Um, you should kind of do a similar plus process. That's, that's, my, that's my thinking right there, in my opinion. So you grab the schedule of values, you grab the latest observation report of what actually has happened on the job, right? Observation report, schedule of values, certificate for payment, and you compare it. You look at all of them and you're like, okay, so he said that he installed the cheap rock. Let me go to my latest observation report, meaning you've been on site and you've done observations and there are pictures. Yep, it looks like the cheap rock is there, this and that. Oh, he said he bought all the doors. Did I see any doors on my pictures? Were they saved? Where were they, right? And you compare it. And then you see the prices. It's like, well, he said that cheap rock was supposed to cost this much on the schedule of value, but he's charging this much. Why is it different? I'm going to scratch that and I'm going to verify it and change it. And I'll certify the payment for the amount that I believe is accurate, right? So the things that you will always have to look at whenever you're going to certify a payment, schedule of values. Also, you got to look at the schedule of construction. Why? because they may be charging you for something that wasn't supposed to happen until the end. So another little item. So let me just try to put a bunch of items. So schedule your values, one. Certificate for payment, you're gonna be getting that. Observation report from your latest site visit and your latest schedule of construction or your construction schedule. So that you know what, what happened, what was supposed to happen, how much he's charging and where he's getting his numbers from. Does it make sense, everybody? And you guys can all talk whenever you want to. That's all good. All right. So that's kind of like the process of understanding whether you can certify that payment for that full amount, reject that payment, or change the amount. You can certify for whichever amount you feel like it's accurate. And then later on, you'll figure it out. Okay. So that section, if the article nine or the section nine is really, really all about that. And that's really, you know, payment is so important because the lack of it will actually kill a project. Paying too much of it will actually make it so that it's over budget and it runs out of money and then you can't finish the job. So it's, it's super critical. So we are, as the architect, the ones that work for the owner and 
certify the payment to the owner, right? It's not even for the contract, it's to the owner saying whether they're entitled to that payment or not. That's our certificate, that's what our certificate says. So now going back, I'm gonna read section 9.617. So it says, unless the contractor provides the owner with a payment bond in the full penal, penal sum of the contract sum, uh, payments received by the contractor for work properly performed by subcontractors or provided by suppliers shall be held by the contractor for those subcontractors or suppliers who perform work or furnish materials or both on the contract with the contractor for which payment was made by the owner. Nothing contained herein shall require money to be placed in a separate account and not commingled with money of the contractor create any fiduciary liability or tort liability on the part of the contractor for breach of trust or entitle any person or entity to an award of punitive damages against the contractor for breach of the requirements of this provision. It's a mouthful. That's why I say these contracts are so long, but generally saying, you know, money paid to the contractor to pay his subs, it's put on an account, the same account that everything is supposed to go to and it's to pay that subcontractor. Is not for him to put it somewhere else or take it from another and take, you know, people who use the word, you know, steal from Peter to pay Paul type of deal. It should all be from there. And he's really trying to protect the owner so that a subcontractor doesn't go after the owner and says, you haven't paid me, what's going on here? When the contractor, when the owner actually has said, yeah, I paid the contractor to pay you. So the subs don't have any like the the owner doesn't have any responsibilities towards a sub and so doesn't the sub have to go after him for payment he should go after the contractor for payment right so that's kind of how it works in fact the subs don't have a contract with the owner nope they don't they have a contract with the contractor um in public work at least here in massachusetts they do this thing called uh request for direct payment it's actually not even appropriate to do that because it's a public entity that does not have a contract with the sub. So why is the sub going directly to them? It, 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 it just can't happen. In the same way that you can't put a lien on a public property because it belongs to the public. It's, you can't put a lien on that. So I mean, that's another, another uh, term to know about, okay? So then we go to section 9.6.8. <clears throat> Provided the owner has fulfilled its payment obligations under the contract documents, the contractor shall defend and indemnify the owner for, from all loss, liability, damage, or expense. <clears throat> By the way, the word defend means protect him, legal fees, pay to, for legal fees to defend that owner in court. All right? Because the owner has completed his obligation to pay. The contractor shall identify and hold harmless and, 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 and defend him, right? Uh, from any loss, liability, damage, or expense, including re reasonable attorney fees and litigation expenses arising out of any lien claim or other claim for payment by a subcontractor or supplier of any tier. It goes hand in hand with the 9.6.7. <clears throat> it's saying if you've paid me as the contractor owner, then the subs shouldn't be going after you. But if they are going after you, I got to protect you. So it is it is saying, contractor, don't, don't withhold payment from your subs because you're going to end up having to pay for my legal fees if the subs come after me as the owner, okay? But from receipt of, uh, of notice of a lien claim or other claim for payment, the owner shall notify the contractor. If approved by the applicable court when required, the contractor may substitute a surety bond. By the way, surety bond is an insurance company, is a bond, is a protection, is an amount that covers the contractor. And they substitute the surety bond for the property against which the lien or other claim for payment has been asserted. It's saying, here is this bond, here's this insurance that's gonna cover you for what you're owed let go of this property that belongs to Mr. Owner. So it's gonna just transfer that um, purity or, or, or whatever. It's, it's, it's almost like saying, take these, hold them harmless, because I have said that if they have paid me, I will have to defend them if you were to do this. So it, you know, try to follow the sequence of events, but that's kind of how it works. So 9.7. 
failure of payment. If the architect does not issue a certificate of payment through no fault of the contractor within seven days after receipt of the contractor's application for payment, remember I said 10 days before, I think, well, it's 10 days before and I think seven days. Uh, so let's say it was the 30th that the payment was due. They submitted the 10th, I mean the 20th. So we have like three days um, to either, you know, certify the payment or not. Um, so if, if within those seven days, um, through no fault of the contractor, um, the architect does not issue a certificate of payment, or if the owner does not pay the contractor within seven days after the date established in the contract document, the amount certified by the ar architect or war awarded by binding this proof resolution, then the contractor may, upon seven additional days notice to the owner and architect, stop the work until payment of the amount owing has been received. I remember, I don't know if you heard before, um, we were talking about when can, can the work stop. So the work can only be stopped by the owner or by the authority having jurisdiction by, you know, some sort of executive order. You know, the, a governor could stop the work on a place and the president could stop the work on a place. The building inspector could issue a stop work order, and those are authorities having jurisdiction. They, are, they have the power and authority to do that. But the owner can actually direct to stop the work. The architect cannot direct to stop the work. The contractor can stop the work. When? Well, only if they have not been paid. If they have not been paid, so let's say they submitted the application for payment on the 20th of the month. They didn't get paid within seven days of that then they will say we will stop the work within seven more days so basically about 14 days after they've submitted the application for payment meaning seven days late from their payment they can stop the work and they have to actually issue it they can't just stop they have to say it why because that's when the clock starts ticking within that time so if they don't do it that way then they're violating the contract and they have to follow the contract any questions anybody I uh, just wanted to add something. I, I believe the only other time the contractor can, can stop the work is when they discover hazardous material that's um, on site. Yes and no. I'll tell you why. Okay. They can only stop the work on that portion of the scope of the job. Right. But they, can, they have to continue working on other areas. Mm -hmm. So first they inform the owner and architect together, because they cannot talk to the owner directly. As you know, they got to talk through the architect. So they contact the owner and architect together, let them know, maybe in an email, CC in the architect, it's all good, that mm -hmm. they found some whatever hazardous materials, they found a dead cow in this job site or whatever happens to be, and they stop the work there, but they don't stop the work everywhere. Right, okay? in the affected area. So basically they stop the work is it's trying to, to limit the amount of delays on the job. So a real stop work is this one. This is a real, this is a complete stop work. It means they take their tools and leave, they're out. <laughs> so um, that's different. And they stop the work because there's hazardous materials, anything they can do to continue pushing the project forward, they, they can do, and that's okay. And they're entitled to payment for that work. So, but again, uh, and that's very good, Menti. So the contract time should be extended, of course, appropriately, and the contract sum should be increased by the amount of the contractor's reasonable cost of shutdown, right? Because they actually did stop the work. They actually left the site. They actually went somewhere else. They probably had another job. So they had to take all that stuff and leave because they didn't get paid within the seven days, seven days late, actually. Delay in startup plus interest as provided by the contract documents. So, you know, this is something the owners don't want to do. They don't want to be late and cause their projects to be delayed. They want their projects to be done. Owners want their projects to be finished on time, on budget, and beautiful, right? They want all that stuff. So then we're going to go to section 9.8, substantial completion. This is a big one. I want you to remember the word substantial completion. I want you to understand what substantial completion is. And before I jump into it, I want to ask anybody, does anybody know what substantial completion is? Anybody? 
maintain? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's when the work is at the stage where the owner can use it for its intended use. Uh, yeah, when the, the project could be used for its intended purpose. Purpose, right. Exactly. So, meaning a bus is supposed to provide water and it provides water and it's supposed to provide cold water and hot water. Yeah, it provides cold water and hot water and it closes right in. Um, now, another thing that's a good sign that a project is substantially complete is that you could actually get a certificate of occupancy, meaning you could pass or could have passed or have already passed all inspections. Plumbing inspection, frame inspection, insulation inspection, electrical inspection, finished electrical, finished plumbing, right? Rough plumbing, rough framing. All of the inspections have been passed. Fire protection inspections, all of them have been passed. That's when you could actually use the project for its intended purpose. If a railing is missing on a stair, would you be substantially complete at that point? Maintain? No. Why not? It's just a railing. Because it's not safe. Because it's violating a code. It was not passing inspection with a railing missing. Not in my watch, not on my watch, for sure. So that's it. You know, it could be as simple as that, right? Um, the paint got banged up with a little furniture that the owner was moving into the space. Is the project substantially complete? Yes. Yes, why? Why is this substantially complete? There's a hole in my wall, a little hole. It's not a big hole, but it's it's a hole. It happened. Why is it substantially complete? Really? Why? Uh, because you can suck it up and use it. <laughs> exactly. It's not hurting anybody. It's not gonna hurt anybody. It's just an aesthetic type of thing, cosmetic type of thing. It's not a life hazard. You would still pass inspection. Period. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. Why is substantial completion such a such a big deal? Why is it so important? Why is this? Why does it even have its own chapter, like its own nine point eight, its own area? Why? Anybody? Uh, I believe two things uh, that's pretty important that happens during substantial completion. One is a warranty begins uh, that covers one year after substantial completion for the owner. And two is a release of uh, retainage by the owner to the contractor. Exactly. And it's also a date that we have established all the way back in the A101 in the contract between the owner and the architect. I mean, the owner and the, and the contractor, but also in the B101, there is an estimated time for that. And it's also the deadline in which consequent, uh, no consequent, liquidated damages begin to, if you were to have liquidated damages. I don't know if you heard what liquidated damages are, but that's when they start kicking. Because if you are late by the substantial, the substantial completion date is late, it means the owner cannot use it. And I can think of a million different projects. Let's say a Target store needs to open by Christmas, right? And every day that they are not open by Christmas, they're actually losing money. There is holding costs. There is also cost of money that they could have earned had they been open by Christmas so that they, or before Christmas so that they can sell. They, they have a, you know, a forecast of the amount of items that they're supposed to sell, the amount of revenue that they're supposed to generate. And every day that they're not making that money, it, they actually put a punishment to the contractor for being late. They need to be substantially complete so that the people can use the space. Can, can be there, right? And the houses that they can live there, safely live there, right? And, uh, you know, stories that they can actually sell and be there, you know? They might have a little sign that says, pardon our appearances doing renovations, but it means we still, you can still use us, but, you know, we're not looking that great right now, but we still can still use us, you know? That's the stuff. And substantial completion, again, you said it, you nailed it right there. It is when retainage begins to get released, is when um, the owner can actually occupy the space, is when the uh, warranties for one year for finishing anything that needs to be finished or fits, kicking, um, all of that stuff, all of that good stuff uh, takes place. In fact, 
were not to be hanging out in that property for much longer after substantial completion, not for, for too long, even as the architect, us as the architect, because our duty is really as far as almost a substantial completion, you know, substantially. And then final completion, yeah, we'll do the final send off and farewell, everybody's happy, but substantial completion is the big day. So let's read that real quick. <laughs> So section 9.8.1, substantial completion is the stage in the process of the work when the work or designated portion thereof, by the way, could there be multiple substantial completions, Mentin? I'm sorry? Could there be multiple substantial completions on a project? Uh, yes. Yeah, because it could be phased. It could be the phase one of the project. It could be the plumbing is substantially complete. All plumbing fixtures are working the way that they're supposed to do. So there could be a portion of it that is substantially complete. That's right. So again, substantial completion is the stage in the progress of the work when the work or designated portion thereof is sufficiently complete in accordance with the contract documents so that the owner can occupy or utilize the work for its intended purpose, its intended use. It's kind of redundant. You said it right before I actually mentioned. So yeah, that's right. So it's intended use. So doors are supposed to open and close. Windows are supposed to open and close. The floor is supposed to be level. Like stairs are supposed to be, you know, 7-Eleven or whatever. Like they have all of those things are how they're supposed to be. Make a good distinction between something that is not beautifully appealing versus something that's not substantially complete. Because that's not a problem. And that has aesthetic, that's culturally passed the entire inspection, that doesn't matter. All right, so let me go. Eight says when the contractor considers that a work or a portion thereof, which the owner agrees to accept separately, is substantially complete. By the way, you hear that the contractor is the one that considers that he is substantially complete. He's the one that considers that he's delivered substantially, and the owner can agree to accept a portion of it or the whole thing, okay? But the contractor is the one that considers it. And listen to what he does. The contractor shall prepare and submit to the architect a comprehensive list of items to be completed or corrected prior to final payment. What is that list called? Anybody knows? We use the name for that. The punch list. That's right. And the one that creates the punch list is the contractor, believe it or not. Even though we are the ones that are always like, oh, that's wrong, this is wrong, this is this, this. We don't even do the list. They do the list. We can revise it and say, mm, I don't think so. I think there's some other things that you haven't finished. But they generate that list. They are the ones that are responsible. Now, anybody knows why? Why is the contractor the one that generates the punch list and the one that even considers that he's substantially complete? There's no wrong or right answer to this. You can say whatever you want. All right, I'll pitch in. You give me no option. So, because he's the one building it. Like if you're building, uh, you know, a house, you should know when it's done <laughs> because you're the one building it. You're the one that's reading the drawings, interpreting the drawings and building it. You're the one that knows what's missing. You should know what's missing more than anybody else because you're the one putting it together. Right, if I'm the one building a puzzle, I got all the pieces and I should know that I still have five pieces of that puzzle to put together. Yeah, you know, the picture is our architectural drawings on a little puzzle, right? We look at the picture, we look at what we're building, we somehow have a few extra pieces, it means we're not done. If all the pieces are in and it looks like the picture and it feels like the picture, we're substantially complete, we're actually finally complete. Final completion. So the contract is the one building it. He's the one that you know whether he's done or not. Of course, we're gonna rectify it and say, nah, I, I don't think you're substantially complete. I, you know, we can reject that stuff and say, nope, that's not right because of non-conforming work and so forth. 
<clears throat> so failure to include an item on such list does not alter the responsibility of the contractor to complete all work in accordance with the contract documents. That they didn't put it in there doesn't mean that they are done with that item. That item could be found anytime. In fact, you have a year to finish it. Anytime, okay? Most contractors tend to disappear after substantial completion. A lot of them. I'm not bullshitting about them. I'm not, you know, I've acted as a contractor and I know why. I understand it. We are tired. We're done. We want to get out of there. Really? Like, that's it. I've been, I acted as a contractor. And as much as I like my clients and I like everybody, projects you just don't want to see it anymore. I mean, I don't even like to see myself in the mirror sometimes. I mean, it's just, you get tired. So, you know, for many reasons. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes you're not making enough money. Sometimes you've already gotten paid most of the money and you feel like you don't have much left in there and you just want to walk away. Now I'm saying you, but that's not you. It's a contractor, right? Remember you had. I've acted as contractor. I've acted as architect. I've acted as owner. I've done all three of them and a combination of them. And I know why things happen the way they happen. Um, so... So that that's that if, if they didn't put it on the list, doesn't mean that they should have not done it. It doesn't mean that it was done properly. It could be discovered later on. If they run away, it could be actually discovered in a lawsuit later on. They get a you know a little letter in the mail and they're like, Yep, yeah, you've been summoned to court. Um, because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So section 9.8.3. Upon receipt of the contractor's list, this is us now. The actor will make an inspection. By the way, we don't make exhaustive inspections. We don't make a whole lot of them. We, we make this one right here. We really only make inspection on substantial completions when we get the punch list. My bad, sorry. So the actor will make an inspection to determine whether the work or designated, designated portion thereof is substantially complete. If the architect's inspection discloses any item, whether or not included on the contractor's list, which is not su sufficiently complete in accordance with the contract document, so that the owner can occupy or utilize the work or designated portion thereof for its intended purpose, the contractor shall, before issuance of the certificate of substantial completion, complete or correct such item upon notification by the architect. In such case, the contractor shall then submit a request for another inspection by the applicant to determine substantial completion. Now, we would say, well, then if this goes on and on. Why did they never finish it? Well, one, the architect is entitled to additional services because of coming over and over to check the work that should have been completed. Um, but two, the, the owner could actually dismiss that contractor and get another one. And that, you know, that will be very sad, but that can happen. 9.8.4. When the work or designated portion thereof is substantially complete, the architect will prepare a certificate of substantial completion. I want you to look into that. Um, I think it's an actual AIA document, certificate of substantial completion. That's why it's capitalized too. Uh, that shall establish the date of substantial completion, establish responsibilities of the owner and contractor for security, maintenance, heat, utilities, damage to the work and insurance, and fix the time within which the contractor shall finish all items on the list accompanying the certificate. So certificate is going to say, yeah, but you got to keep, now you can change the paint because it wasn't supposed to be pink, it was supposed to be blue, you know, or whatever. Those things could be done within that time that's fixed in there. Warranties required by the contract documents shall commence on the date of substantial completion. Menton was right um, of the work or designated portion thereof, unless otherwise provided in the certificate of substantial completion. Because you can make amends, you can actually put contingencies within that. You know, this certificate of uh, this substantial completion certificate is continuing upon you finishing such and such. Why would you do it if it's going to be continuing upon something? Well, it's something minor, but I do want to hold him to it. So if I put it in here, second thing you see, it will actually be voided if they never finish it within that period of time. So then they will be in breach of contract by default. Okay, so then we go in here. And the more you deal with contracts, guys, the more you deal with paperwork and things like that, the more familiar you get. 
eventually you'll probably like it too. I kind of like this stuff. Um, so 9.8.5, the certificate of financial completion shall be submitted to the owner and contractor for their written acceptance of responsibilities assigned to them in the certificate. So it's submitted to the owner and contractor and they both have to accept it. And it is really just saying, Mr. Or Mr. Contractor, you've substantially completed this building. This building is no longer your responsibility. It is Mr. Owner's responsibility. So it kind of gets hand over. That's why you give insurances, paperwork, project manual, um, warranties of each one of the, of the things, operations manual for the HVAC system or any particular system. Everything gets handed over. Um, now the electricity is no longer under the contractor's name because actually the contractor spent for electricity, heat, and all that stuff for a while during the whole project. Now it goes all to Mr. Owner. Okay. So, and upon acceptance of such acceptance and consent of surety of anything, the owner shall make payment of retainage applying to the work or the native portion thereof. Mentim said it. Retainages get released at that point. Retainages is that at every certificate of payment that's being submitted or application for payment that's being submitted prior to us certifying, of course, once it's being certified, a portion of that amount gets withheld. And that sometimes is the equivalent to the profit of the whole job. So, of course, they want to finish the job because they've paid everybody and that money that's left is actually what they would have made on the job. Otherwise, they would just be breaking even and nobody likes to break even because that's kind of like a non-profit type of charity type of work. Like it's for free. You're not making anything. We don't do that. Contractors don't do that. Nobody does that. So um, that's when they actually get released that retainage. Such payment shall be adjusted for work that is incomplete or not in accordance with the contract, with the requirements of the contract document. Well, you know what? We, we have uh, $80,000 retainage for you. We're going to give you $75,000 because you've not finished painting the whole floor and everything. We don't want you to paint it. We want you gone because we don't like you or whatever the reason may be. Well, we hold the 5000 and you're all right. See you later. Okay. Or it could be the other way. We will pay you $75,000. Once you come back and finish painting the entire place, we'll pay you the last $5,000. Now, a little side note. I am the only person on earth that I know that would still issue a payment to somebody that hasn't performed something but promises to perform it in the next time and does it over and over and over again. I don't know. I'm a very forgiving kind of guy with some projects, not with the money of my clients or anything, projects that belong to me. I'm like, you know what? If it takes you 10 years, 10 years it is. I don't care. Sometimes I'm not in a rush or whatever, but guys, don't do that. Don't be like me. If they fail once or twice, don't give them more chances. Just out. you out. Don't give more money than what they're supposed to get. I don't give 50% deposits. I give like 60 and 70% deposits. And then I wonder why they're gone for three months. And you're like, why? Well, because you gave them money to party with. So they're going to go party now. You know, people like, some people like to, to, to get the reward before they do the, the work. And, you know, and I've been indulging that sometimes and I should not do that. You know, it sucks, uh, but I'm very forgiven, I guess, because I make a lot of mistakes and I'm always trying to, I guess I, I'm always trying to make amends. So that's just my little personal note. Don't do that. Don't be like me. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's going to make you uh, like, you know, die young. <laughs> but, you know, such payment shall be adjusted for work that's incomplete again. And if it's not completed, don't pay it. If it's not done, don't pay it. When they're completed and it looks great, pay it. Not, not even if they tell you that they, they no, look, let me send you a picture. We that completed. Can you make me a transfer right now? I am making no transfer. I'm going to go there. I'm going to walk to the place. I'm going to take a look at it. And I'm going to pay you when it's good. I've been at both sides. I've been a contractor where the person says, until I pass all inspections, I'm not paying you. And I'm a man saying, I'm not entitled to payment. 
for final payment if I haven't passed all my inspections. It means I'm not done. I'm not substantially complete. So I get it. You know, there've been others in which it's like, I'm not paying you until I feel like I'm like you're done. And I'm like, I passed my inspection. Everything looks good. Everything looks perfect. Like it shouldn't be until you feel like it, you know, that's the opposite. That's a bad example. It shouldn't be like, if you feel like it, it should be like, you did the work, you're paid. You didn't do the work, you're not paid. So, um, you know, I do understand things happen too. So I, there was a particular case in which the guy's father died. So I was like, you know, you're late by three weeks. I know what that's like. You know what? He got, died. Take care of that stuff. You know, take care of the funeral and then come back. And, you know, you sometimes you have to understand. But if they're not done, if they haven't finished it, you don't pay them. Partial occupancy or use. This can happen. People can actually use a portion of their building. Um, the owner may occupy or use any completed or partially completed portion of the work at any stage when such portion is designated by separate agreement with the contractor provided such occupancy or use is consented to by the insurer, I, I, insurer and authorized by public authorities having jurisdiction over the project. So like the insurance company is letting you use it. And the authority having a restriction, meaning the building department is issuing, issuing you a partial occupancy permit. So you're good. You can go right at it. It's all consented. It's all good. It, and it also has to be on the contract documents that they're supposed to be able to use that space by that date. Sometimes things are not foreseen, foreseen or for, like have been foreseen early enough that you could actually know that they could use the space. But you can amend the contract along the way. I mean, that's what change orders are for. And say, listen, I'm going to be moving into that bedroom. Will you, meet, will you mind finishing that first? I'll move in and you can finish the rest of the house later because I need a place to be. I don't want to be at a hotel or whatever the case may be. That's okay. If the authority has jurisdiction, says it's okay because otherwise it will be an illegal um, occupancy. Such partial occupancy or use may commence whether or not the portion is substantially complete, provided the owner and contractor have accepted in writing their responsibilities assigned to each of them for payments, retainage, if any, security, maintenance, heat, utilities, damage or to the work and insurance, and have agreed in writing concerning uh, the period for correction of the work and commencement of warranties required by the contract documents. When the contractor considers a portion substantially complete, the contractor shall prepare and submit a list, remember that, to the architect as provider of the section 9.8.2 consent of the contractor to partial occupancy or use shall not be unreasonably withheld. The stage of the progress of the work shall be determined by in writing by written agreement between the owner and contractor, or if not agreement is reached by decision of the of the architect. We're gonna finish 9.9.2 and 9.9.3, and then we'll leave it at 9.10 for tomorrow. All right. So any questions so far? Like for the owner to be able to use the space, the contractor's gotta agree. All right. And the owner's gotta pay that that space is actually completed. Okay. They both have to be in agreement. If they're not in agreement, then the architect will make the decision. You see that at the end? Because we are the IDM. That's a term in the contract, initial decision maker. We are the ones. So if there's a little conflict, minor conflict, we'll make the decision. If they don't like it, then they're gonna have to go to a claim and they're gonna have to follow the dispute resolution method that they have selected, mediation, arbitration, litigation, whichever the method may be, okay? And we'll get more into those later. So section 9.9.2, immediately prior to such partial occupancy or use, the owner, contractor, and architect shall jointly inspect the area to be occupied or portion of the work to be used in order to determine and record the condition of the work. Yeah, I personally did that. I have an owner. They actually came from vacation to move into their space not long ago. I went and walked the site with them, took a look at everything. They weren't happy with some little things here, some little things there. We marked them all up. We took notes. We fixed them all up and they were happy and they released a check and everybody's happy. Done. But they could move in. We inspected it prior to them moving in. They wanted to use a bathroom. We got to make sure that their bathroom is ready, that everything looks good. Okay. They've been living out of a garage for a long time. So you know what? 
we inspected the work, we did everything, everybody's paid, everybody's happy. So that's that's kind of the way to go. Um, you can't just have the owner inspect it or the contractor inspect it and send pictures or the architect inspect it and send pictures. Why? Because like we're in this together, you know, you don't you don't want to trust, it's not just that you don't trust them, but hey, like we should all agree that this is completed, right? If they weren't a part of the meeting. Doesn't matter then. It's not valid. It's not. It's not valid. Everybody's got to be in that meeting to make sure that you've given the space in the conditions that you gave the space. I do a video. I do a photo shoot of the whole thing. I make sure everything is clear. Everything is beautiful. I'm the first one that's actually looking at everything that was wrong, either if I'm acting as contractor or as an architect, so that I can learn it for the next step, but also so that I can call them up and say, "Hey, listen, you got to fix that." So section nine point nine point three. And I'm gonna like emphasize something. Our duty or responsibility when we're administering the contract for construction is huge. Doing that those certificate for payments, either you know the progress payment certificates that we do or the substantially complete, you know, or the final completion, those are huge, huge. That's why this is so important. And doing the math, it's simple math and stuff like that. And you're going to encounter questions like that on the construction evaluation exam. But it really is us being kind of like the authority that makes sure that everything is fair, right? People are paid for the work they did and they're not paid if they didn't do it. And we're not just protecting the owner or the contractor because in either case, we want to be fair to both. In fact, we're supposed to be unbiased. We're protecting the project. Right, we're like the doctor at the at the surgery table when they're giving a delivery, and we're not just protecting the wife. I mean, the or the the woman or whoever it is, you know, we're protecting the baby. Like we're here to deliver a baby, right? That project is what we're here to deliver. You know, the husband is the contractor. Yeah, we're yeah we wanted to be happy, sure. The wife we wanted to be happy, yes. But honestly, when we're delivering this thing. The number one priority is that project. And if the contractor isn't getting paid, that project ain't going to happen. If the owner is overpaying and is broke, that project ain't going to happen. If the all like, you know, it's all, it's, 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 you know, we're like finding consensus. We want to make sure everybody gets paid what they need to get paid. The owner gets the, the project completed as he should be, you know, completed. And this is where it gets tricky to become a design builder because you want to please the owner. You want to also please yourself as a contractor architect. But you got to make a profit. You know, you love those decor outlets and those nice light, lighting fixtures, but they ain't paying for it. So who is it gonna, who is gonna pay for it? You? You know, I struggle with it because sometimes I want to give so much and I'm used to delivering so good on architecture, but then the construction part, you know, it's not on me. I should I should not have to pay for any of that stuff. They, it's their project, it's their responsibility, it's their problems. So, um, you know, we got to sometimes just, you know, even if we design the project, we're also the builder. We got to compromise and say, he, here it is. You're not going to get that window. You're not going to be able to get that. You know, it's, it costs this much. You're not going to be able to do it. You know, don't absorb it. You should never absorb a cost of anything. And in the construction evaluation exam, guys, you're going to have questions in which, you're kind of being pointed at as, are you a fault? Is this a fault? Whose responsibility is it? Most of the time, contractor or owner. Architect is almost never a fault of anything when it comes to construction, unless it's an error or omission. Okay? So we're not a fault if they didn't install the cabinet correctly. We're not a fault if they didn't install enough cabinets. We're not a fault if the cabinet doesn't fit in the space. Why? Because they're supposed to make sure it fits. We're not supposed to make sure it fits. We're supposed to design it so that it fits. And if it fits in the drawing, it should fit in there too. So they should figure out how to fit it, right? We're not responsible for means and methods, right? So there's a whole lot that we're not responsible for. And we have to definitely make sure uh, that, that things are done that way. And then 9.9.3, unless otherwise agreed upon, partial occupancy or use of a portion or portions of the work shall not constitute acceptance of work not complying with the requirements of the contract document. The fact that you're using it and living in it doesn't mean it is right. That's all it's really saying. 
it does not mean it is right. We're using it sometimes because, hey, I'm sick of living out of a garage. I'm sick of sleeping on a couch. I want to sleep in my bedroom. And you finish my bedroom to a good point where I can sleep in it. But guess what? It ain't painted. The carpet's not installed. And I don't care for now. I want to live in it. Right? So I'm not saying, yes, it's all good. All right? So acceptance of work doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Acceptance of the space, I mean. Right? Acceptance of the space doesn't mean it complies. Okay? We just take it because you you're fed up. You're tired, you know? So that doesn't mean it's right. So they got to correct it. That's one thing I do well, babe, I, as a contractor, when I act as a contractor is I will do anything I can to fix anything that you don't like. If it was in the contract, and even if it wasn't, I will try to figure out a way of making sure that you're happy with it. And it might take a while, and it might take some fixes, and it might mean, I might need to come back or whatever a few times. We'll try to fix it. So I don't want to be the guy that didn't try. I will always try. So, you know, that's good. So, and I put different hats throughout these classes, guys. Contractor, architect, owner, you know, as an owner, I'm one person. As a contractor, I'm another. As an architect, I'm not another one, too. As an architect, that's the most difficult one. It's really the most difficult one because you got you can't be on anybody's side. You have to be for the project, and it's very difficult. So we're going to leave it at section 9.9.3. I'm going to upload this on our YouTube channel. Subscribe, put some comments, like it, and we'll see you on the other side. I want you all guys to... Do great. Thank you so much.